There's a song that says, the doors of progress, when the doors of progress have closed in your face, and no matter oh, what you do, your friends, they don't appreciate, all you gotta do is just steal away. And go down on your knees, oh, tell God, have mercy, please. Come on, Jesus, come on, Jesus, come on and see about me. There's another one that says, the right way, yeah, is the narrow way. It don't have no crooks and bends. Oh, but when I started this Christian journey, I found out Jesus was my only friend. All you got to do is just steal away. Oh, and go down on your knees and tell God, have mercy, mercy on me. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. You ought to just tell Jesus, come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. I need you to see about me. Come on, Jesus. Say, we need you in our homes. We need you in our schools. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. We need you. 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 We need you, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. We need you to come on in this place. Oh, come on and see. Come on and see. Bow me. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the place where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding bleeding sigh because victory is mine victory is mine victory today is mine is that anybody's declaration on the day i told satan you gotta get behind because victory today is mine oh tell me who can stand be for us when we call on that great name jesus jesus precious jesus we have the victory Story. Can we pick that up just real quick and then we're going to leave it alone? Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. mine, mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Anybody know joy is mine? Joy is mine. Joy is mine. Joy today is mine. mine. I told Satan, you gotta get behind. Cause joy today is mine. Oh, tell me who can stand be for us when we call on that great name jesus jesus precious jesus we have the victory oh tell me who can stand be for us when we call on that great name jesus jesus precious jesus we have the victory 
Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. What's his name? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. We have the victory. Come on and clap your hands in this place. Well, come on, if you know you got the victory, come on, the best praise you got. Come on, I said, if you know you got the victory, come on, give God the best praise you got. If you're glad God woke you up early this morning, come on, give God the best praise you got. Come on, if you're glad you got the activities of your limb. Come on, if you're glad you're clothed in your right mind. If you're glad he kept you safe. And you know you got the victory. Come on, open up your mouth early this morning and shout glory. Come on, I said shout glory. Come on, shout hallelujah. If you know you've been saved. Come on, if you know you've been redeemed. If you know you've been bought with a price. And you're not ashamed to let the world know. Come on, shout hallelujah. Come on, all saints said, I feel better. So much better since I laid my burdens down. Anybody want to lay your burdens down this week? Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty, what a mighty God we serve. We certainly honor God for our pastor and our leader. Our chieftain of this conference, the legendary Dr. Frank Ray Sr. Come on, let's thank God for him. Certainly thank him for thinking enough of the kingdom to bring us together this week for learning and to increase the burning and for a revival this week. And we believe that God is going to indeed move in a tremendous way. All week long, already started last night as we celebrated our pastor for 20 years of this conference, 50 years of pastoring and preaching, and 75 years of life. Did we not have a marvelous time last night? Amen. And we've come to this morning glorious service to hear a word from the Lord. And our first preacher, we are extremely proud to have him. Uh, He's a part of the family now. He, he married into the family, so I, I try to treat him as nice as I can. And I, I can't help it because he is indeed a nice guy. And we appreciate him, and he is a preacher. He is the newly elected pastor of New Bethel over there in South Memphis. And I want you to be patient with him this morning as he delivers the devotional message. Would you lift your hand towards Reverend Bartlett Jr. and say, Reverend Bartlett, we're hungry this morning and we're asking you to feed our hungry souls. Amen. Come on, let's receive him as he comes. Come on, let's put those hands together again. Amen. To the angel of this house, our visionary, our host pastor, Papa Ray, thank you, man, for the opportunity to come and share and to uh, the beautiful, my wife, uh, First Lady Amber Ray Bartlett of the New Belt of Baptist Church and <clears throat> to our speaker of the hour, Dr. Tolan Morgan into our own son in the ministry, Reverend Zeta, to my pastor, Pastor Brian Bartlett Sr., amen, for coming out. Revelations chapter 2. to all of these fine preachers and pastors of the gospel. Good to have you. Good to see some of you. 
Revelations chapter 2, we'll look at verse 12 and we'll conclude at verse 17. <clears throat> Revelations chapter 2, verse 12 says, And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he with half the sharp sword with two edges. I know thou works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful witness, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear that the Spirit said unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying he that receiveth it. God bless you. I want to talk from a question. Did you read the letter? Did you read the letter? Uh, there was a young man who went into the army and to, to protect this country. And while he was there in the army, every chance he got, he wrote his mother a letter. And every time he wrote his mother, she would write him back. He would ask her how were things going back at home, and she would ask him how things are going with him. One day he wrote a letter to his mother saying that he was coming home within a month, but his mother didn't write him back. He begins to worry and couldn't wait to get home and check on his mother just to make sure that everything was all right. He gets home and he sees mother. The mother was filled with joy, excitement, and she was also shocked that her son was home. She said, son, why didn't you tell me that you were coming home? He replied with the question, did you read my letter? Then it dawned on me that his mother wouldn't have been shocked to see him only if she read the letter. Hence our text tonight, and here's our text this morning. Jesus addresses the church at Pergamon through the Apostle John. Jesus commends the church at Pergamon for keeping the faith despite intense persecution and the pervading worship of Satan that surround them. The city of Pergamos was the capital of Asia. It was renowned for its political power, its intellectual achievements, and its pagan worship. Pergamum lays about 60 miles north of Smyrna and 15 miles from the coast of the Aegean Seas. It was a wealthy city and was also known for its pagan temples. I discovered that this church was doctrinally pure, but they drifted into compromising the word of God with the world. Some important things that I see about this letter. Number one, I see the architect of the letter. An architect is a person who plans and oversees the development of his creation. In other words, the Lord knew what his word would do to us when we read it. Jesus is the one church with the two-headed sword. The sword is the word of God. And can I tell you that the word of God is the only thing that can defeat satanic opposition. God's word can, can and will be an encouragement to the believer. This is why I encourage everyone to read your Bibles daily. Don't just open your Bibles on Sunday morning or on Bible study night. We have to read it each and every day. 
And watch this. Just don't read it just to say you read it, but read it to understand it. Yeah, the sword was the symbol of the Roman proconsul. It was most important that the church fear the sword of the Lord rather than the sword of the Roman authority. I want you to know, church, that the word of God cuts going and coming. There have been times where I have stood in pulpits preaching the word of God and it was cutting me just as it was cutting y'all in the pews. God's word is very powerful. When you are a real Christian, the word of God will cut you. Can I tell you how powerful it is? The word of God, it repairs and it regenerates. It releases us from bondage. It regulates and guides our lives. And all I'm saying is that at the end of the day, you need the word of God. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that on this walk with Christ, we need him to order our steps. While on this Christian journey, we need him to guide us each and every day. To tell you the truth, I don't know what I'd be doing if I didn't have the Lord walking with me. Yeah, my grandmama said, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Am I right there, church? Not only do I see the architect of the letter, but secondly, I see the audience of the letter. Jesus tells these Christians he knows where they dwell, where Satan's throne is. The Greek word for dwell is the Greek word katokeo. It refers to living at a permanent residence. Jesus is telling them that they are living in a city where Satan influence is strong. Don't that sound like the world? Law enforcement's killing harmless people. People going around robbing innocent bystanders. Senseless shootings. I mean, we can honestly say that we are living in a day and time where Satan influence is strong. But here's Jesus. He starts talking to these people that is allowing this stuff to go on in the church. He tells them that they can't leave Pergamos. He says to them that you stay and you live here and show them that you are a real Christian. And can I tell you that real Christians don't run from difficult situations. He says, don't isolate yourself, but insulate yourself and go against worldly temptation. Yeah, my grandmama told me that God don't want no coward soldiers. And truth be told, with what's going on and what we have allowed in our churches today, lets me know that we have not read the letter. Am I right there? I discovered that we have to continue to refer or be readers and hearers of his word, but also doers of his word. Well, let me go and cut across the field. Not only do I see the architect of the letter, not only do I see, see the audience of the letter, but lastly, I see the affirmation of the letter. Jesus says to the one who conquers, I will give them some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone. The promise of Jesus to the overcomers at the time was a white stone. In Pergamos, the people used special stones with pagan symbols on them for healing and protection. They believed that their stones were good luck charms and kept them safe. The white stone represented many different things. The white stone was used in the Greek courts. The judges in a criminal trial gave their verdict if the party was found not guilty. The white stone was given to a slave when he was set free. The white stone was also used as a badge of authority. The text says that the stone will have a new name on it. My question to you this morning, what name 
will be on your stone. Will liar be on your stone? Will backbiter be on your stone? Will being messy be on your stone? Will being low down to folk be on your stone? What name will be on your on your stone? Well, I got some names or some terms that I would like to recommend to us this morning that I think we should want our names to be associated with on our, on our stones. We should want the name Patience. Therefore, if your name is Patience, then you can and will wait on the Lord. Yeah, David said, I wait impatiently on the Lord. And he inclined his ear unto thee. If your name is patience, then you understand that God may not come when you want him. But he's always on time. Yeah, patience is a good name. Not only should we want the name patience, but we should want the name faith. Yeah, for if your name is faith then you don't need to ask the Lord to help you get over the mountain. If your name is faith, you can speak to the mountain and the mountain shall get out of your way. For the Bible says faith the size of a mustard seed. You can speak to the mountain and the mountain will be moved. If your name is faith, then you have the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Yeah, faith is a mighty good name. Yeah, as I close, I got another name. And this name that I want to tell you about now. You can't have this name. Yes, this name is already taken. You can't have this name, but you show sure ought to know, know this name. Ain't God right? This name is above every name. Ain't God right? This name was given to the one that was born in Bethlehem. This name was given to the one that was raised in Nazareth. Ain't God right? At this name, every knee has got the bow and every tongue must confess ain't God right at this name demons tremble at this name broken hearts are mended at this name my are regulated at this name giants they do fall ain't God right anybody know the name I say anybody know the name what's his name Jesus Lily of the Valley what's his name Jesus bright and morning star ain't God right Jesus joy in sorrow hope for tomorrow ain't God right I'm glad I know the name that name went to a hill called Calvary ain't God right he died 
didn't he die? He died, but he didn't stay dead. Early. I should have had somebody that still get happy off early. Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Don't he get power? If you know he got it, wrap back on your hip. Let your backbone slip. Put your preaching voice on and say, yeah. Say, yeah. Say, yeah. Look at somebody and ask them, do you know their name? Come on, look at somebody and ask them, ask them do you know that name? Come on, you ought to act like you know the name. Come on, if you know who he is. Come on, if you know that he saved you. If you know that he set you free. If you know that he bought you with a price. Come on, you ought to just shout, Jesus. Hey, hey. Move on. Come on, let's thank God for Reverend Brian Bartlett Jr. Come on, let's give it up to him. Thank you, Reverend Bartlett, for blessing our hearts. Have you read? Have you read the letter? Well, it's time for our second preacher on this morning and he's no stranger to us at this frank rate conference he's been coming for a number of years now he is revered all over this country as a preacher's preacher and we are delighted to hear from him on this morning hour he is the proud pastor of the fellowship church down there in warner robbins georgia and we already know what's about to happen in this place on the day so for those of you who came hungry this morning just shout preach, preach. pastor morgan preach, preach pastor morgan let's receive him as he comes To God be the glory for the many things that he has done and then what he is doing and what he will do. This is the day the Lord has made. And we choose to rejoice and be glad in it for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures unto all generations. We honor our heavenly father his son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who hung for six hours one Friday and died until death died. Three days later, he got up out of the grave, not as a weakling, but with all power in his hands. Fifty days later, he sent the Holy Ghost to reside and to preside on the inside of us. And what a joy it is for us to know that we're not just his creation but we're his children and after all that we've been through we still have our right minds but he will keep you in perfect peace as you keep your mind stayed on him how good it is for us to gather together to worship our risen Christ on this Tuesday morning and we are so honored and thankful for our chieftain 
our visionary, our leader, the pastor of the New Salem Baptist Church, the one and the only, Frank Edward Ray. We celebrate you, Pop. Amen. We celebrate you, man. We are the manifestation of vision that God has given to this man of God uh, for this week. 20 years in conference life, 50 years of pastoral life, 75 years of personal life, and uh, God has kept him. I said God has kept him. And the body of Christ is made the better because of men like Pastor Frank Ray. We thank the Lord for our devotional preacher this morning. That's the Bible. Amen. Amen. We bid God speed and grace on him as he begins his pastoral journey to all of the pastors and preachers who are present this morning. And to all of you, the men and women of God that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We were here last night to celebrate the gala of this uh, momentous occasion, so many years of labor and work. And I was honored to not only be present, but to hear my mentor share the gospel of Jesus Christ again in the person of Bishop Edgar Van. Can you help me celebrate this man of God? Bless you, man. Bless you, man. That man was at my first sermon 25 years ago. No, that's true. He really was. And uh, I'm so grateful for his impartation into my life. As a matter of fact, um, I'm here as a fruit of their friendship. <laughs> and uh, I just praise God for both of them, how they have uh, poured into me over the years. Generals in the faith uh, to uh, continue to advance the kingdom of God together. And we just appreciate uh, all that has been said and done uh, so far. If it is your custom that you stand for the word of God, I ask that you would do so. I want to summon your senses and invite your intellect to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter number 20. Jeremiah chapter number 20. And it is there that the Holy Spirit has highlighted for us this context of scripture beginning with verse number seven. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number seven. Your Bible should read, O Lord, you have deceived me. And I was deceived. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone is mocking me. For since I spoke, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But the word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. For I heard the defaming of many fear on every side. Report, said they, and we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, peradventure, he will be enticed and we shall prevail against him. And we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me. As a mighty burning, as a mighty terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble. And they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you that try the righteous and see the reins and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For unto you have I opened my calls. 
Sing unto the Lord. Praise you the Lord. For he has delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. I want to tag this text. I feel like going on. You may be seated in the Lord's church. All of us in this room have our own various challenges. And if the truth be told, those challenges are multiple. Because the way life works, life doesn't let you deal with one problem at a time. More often than not, we are succeeding in some areas while we're challenged in other areas. And so it is safe to surmise that while all of us have various challenges, all of us have one common challenge. And that one common challenge is all of us are struggling with reality. Many of us pay a lot of money to cover up reality. We pay a lot of money to dress up reality. Because so many of us are so consumed with the presentation of who we want people to think we are. And we soon find out that at the end of the day, you still got to deal with reality. And the biggest challenge for reality is that we often discover, but we don't want to say, that not even our spirituality exempts us from reality. There is still some things in this life that we all have to deal with despite how spiritual we are, despite how biblically astute we are. We are all wrestling at some point with our own reality. But what do you do when the reality you're wrestling with is God himself? such as the discipline discovered in the discourse. Jeremiah chapter 20. This is the record of a disgruntled employee who has filed his complaint with management. And his complaint with management is against management. This prophet of the Lord, who was the one that had a clear distinction because of his prenatal ordination, he has been ordained as a prophet to the nations before he ever knew him himself. He gets this assignment in chapter one that sounds laudable, noble. Uh, it sounds celebratory, but that was in chapter one. By the time we get to chapter 20, 
that which sounded laudable and notable and noteworthy and covetous is now that which he wants to resign from. He is a prophet who is wrestling with his own reality with God. And 19 chapters later, his own countrymen have plotted to kill him. His contemporaries have plotted to kill him. You may not know what it's like to be a preacher who is attacked by another preacher. You may not know what it's like. For another man or woman of God to be a problem for another man or woman of God. Jeremiah's challenge is multiple. But in reality, Dr. Youngblood, he could possibly do something about his human challenges. But what could he do if his problem is God? I'm not talking to you deep people who are okay with God right now. I'm talking to the real people who's in here this morning who came to this conference uh, uh, all ready to be spiritual. When the truth is you are serving God and struggling with God at the same time. Jeremiah is the picture and portrait of a disgruntled employee. When we read Jeremiah chapter 20, there is a there is an a, a, a tense dichotomy happening in Jeremiah's ministry. Because between verses three through six, if you got a Bible and can read it, verses three through six. He has been apprehended and thrown in the stocks by one of his contemporaries by the name of Pashur. He kept him in stocks overnight because he didn't like uh, Jeremiah's unwelcomed prophecies. And now he has apprehended uh, Jeremiah, put him in stocks, and the next morning he released Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, upon his release, turned around to Pashur and literally began to prophesy more penal prophecies to Pashur. It would seem that if I've already arrested you for negative content, you would change your content. But he turns around to the very man who arrested him, threw him in stocks and says to him several things. Number one, he says, sir. You are going to become a terror to yourself. He says, number two, you are going to live to watch your friends die at the hand of your own enemies. He says, number three, Judah is going to go into Babylonian captivity. And number four, you, sir, are going to die in captivity turns around and tells him these four specific negative prophecies in verses three through six. But in verse seven and eight, he says, oh, Lord, you have deceived. Me. Let me try it again. You missed it in verses three through six. He turns around and tells Pashur by the word of the Lord that you, sir, are going to be a terror to yourself. 
You're going to watch your friends die at the hands of your enemies. Judah is going to go into Babylonian captivity and you will not survive the captivity. That's verses three through six in the very next verse. Verse seven, he says, now you, Lord, have deceived me. I tried one more time for these people here. Ver verses three through six, y'all. He is bold for God. In verses seven and eight, he is broken over God. I'm going to try it one more time. Verses, verses three through six, he stands for God publicly. But in verse seven, he's struggling with God privately. Uh, in, in, in verses seven, verses three through six, he is bold to prophesy what the Lord told him to do. But in verse seven, he turns right around and complains to God. Catch it, church. He communicates for God, by God, and then complains to God about God. I can't get no help here. You was just talking real bold for me in verses three through six. And then when we have our private prayer meeting, you struggling with me. You complaining. How do you uh, 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 adjust to the public stand and the private struggle? Now, I know your neighbor walked in here this morning and they don't want you to know that they have a private struggle with God. So I'll speak for those of us who are in the room that will testify. This resembles church, a husband and a wife who are small smiles with each other in public, but struggling to like each other privately. This looks like an employee who only works the job for the check but can't stand the job all at the same time. This looks like the saints who shout on Sunday morning and can't. And God during the week because he doesn't agree with your lifestyle. This looks like a preacher pastor who is faithful at the church but can't stand the God of the church. And if the truth be told, if you don't mind exposing some depth of your reality that within the context of all that you do for your church, there are those among us who are struggling privately that while you stand for God you struggling to stand God oh, don't you look around the room just look this way because one of the things that we struggle with in church is that the church wants us to be righteous but it doesn't want us to be real so let me talk to the real people who testify that in all that you know, this is your reality. And I need somebody to speak to my reality. I stand for him publicly. But I'm struggling to stand with him privately. So it raises the question, Dr. Bartlett, how do you handle life when you can't tell the difference between your assignment and your affliction? What do you do when you can't tell the difference between serving God and struggling with God. There's some pastor in here this morning. You at that place. You came to this conference. Because you hoping. That somebody will say something. So you won't go back and quit. Because the church don't know. What's really happening in your spirit. I can't get no help here. God's word to you. 
that this area of where you are is a place you need to be. Because you got to learn how to process bad days. Preaching here, Tolan Morgan. I said you got to learn how to process bad days. Because this walk with God isn't always a good day. Sometimes serving God is a bad day. And you won't last if you don't learn how to process bad days. Here are, here are the little intriguing things of the text and then I'll let you go. Church, Jeremiah has put in his complaint to management. He's complaining to God about God. He said, man, you lied to me. You, you, you lied to me. Um, you told me I was going to be a prophet to the nations. You didn't tell me that my assignment included assassination. You, you told me I was going to be a prophet to the nations. You didn't tell me my friends were going to betray me. You told me I was going to be a prophet to the nations. You didn't tell me that there was going to be some other fellow preachers who couldn't stand me. It was seen that if you are omniscient, you should have told me the whole story. And the reality of the matter is if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to have to accept that God leaves information out. I can't get no help in here. Because if you know everything, you don't know what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. If you know everything, you don't understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. When God really wants you to walk by faith, he'll leave information out. That's why you walking around talking about if it had not been. I wish I had a church in here this morning. For the Lord who was on yours. When God really wants you to walk by faith, there is no full disclosure of information. You, you lied to me. You deceived me. And it seems interesting. That since I'm working for you, this ought to be a better experience. <laughs> Lord, I wish I had some help here. It would appear that since I'm your servant, this ought to be a better experience. But there's some revelation that Jeremiah found out uh, that I think is significant to our purposes here this week. Pop Jeremiah was the prophet of bad news. No, I can't get no help. And his contemporaries were the good news prophets. And Jeremiah's bad news did not come from himself. Because when Jeremiah prophesied, it was always qualified by thus says the Lord. It means that Jeremiah's bad news was still of God. And the good news that the good news prophets were saying was not right news or correct news. But Jeremiah found out banks that the people wanted good news instead of truth. Oh. 
and they did not receive Jeremiah because the text says he was ridiculed and in derision daily. The Hebrew etymology means he was made a laughing stock. Because the people had an appetite for sweets and didn't want what was healthy. I can't get no help here. And we find out in this passage, church, that though he was right in his bad news, he was rejected by people who only wanted good news because the mentality of the people was, if it's good, it's God. Therefore, if it's not good, it's not God, which was an erroneous interpretation of the word of God. And here's what you and I got to learn from this text. Uh, Lonnie Anderson, that which is good doesn't mean it's that which is the truth. But we also got to accept Bishop Van that that which is the truth doesn't necessarily mean it's always good. I can't get no help here. And the real preacher has to be responsible for both. Lord, I can't get no help here. Everybody will flock to the good news, but that doesn't mean it's the truth. And you got to figure out who you going to please, the crowd or God. God has some bad news that he still is the truth. In case you have, I don't know what planet you're living on these days. But if you've been living on planet Earth, the line has been drawn in the sand. And we're going to have to figure out, are we going to stand for God? Or are we going to compromise the gospel to satisfy the culture? The grass withers. I feel like preaching it here. And the flower fades, but the word of the Lord. Shall stand forever. I want to argue something to y'all. Let me argue this. If y'all got a Bible and can read it, Jeremiah got in trouble for telling the truth. Jeremiah prophesied in an active apostasy. The people had forsaken God and gone to other gods, which is why they got in trouble. And God summoned the Babylonians to be their captors. So Jeremiah was preaching the truth. And Jeremiah was the one that ended up in stocks. Jeremiah was the one who was betrayed by his friends. Jeremiah was the one who was in trouble with his contemporaries because he chose to preach the truth over just the good. Do you know what that means, Dr. Bell? Can I tell you what that means? It means Jeremiah Church, watch me, was a victim of his own obedience. He got in trouble for being obedient. Well, I can't get no help here. His obedience landed him in his own personal vulnerability. And that's what he's wrestling with with God. God, how can you let this happen when I've been obedient to your word? Anybody in here ever felt like that? God, how can you let people attack me when I'm only giving them the truth how can you let people in my church rise up against me when I've only told them what you told me to tell them how 
how can you let my friends and my family forsake me when they were with me from the beginning but they can't stand who I am right now ladies and gentlemen let me give you a little FYI some people can only handle you how they met you They can't handle what God has evolved you into. They can't handle the anointing that God has placed on your life. They can't handle the blessing that God has put on your life. So they reduce you to how they met you. If I've been obedient, how is it that I'm a victim of my own obedience? I tell you what I'm going to do. God says you're not going to answer me. I ain't answering you. I tell you what I'm going to do God. Since this is the end result. I quit. I tell you what I'm going to do. Since you're not going to stop them. I'm stopping you. Lord, I wish I had a church in here. I tell you what I'm going to do, God. Since this is what it's like, being obedient, go get somebody else. I quit. Pop Ray, I've been talking just to get to this point. The resignation would have worked. The problem is when Jeremiah quit God, God didn't quit Jeremiah. It would have been a fact. Had God looked at Jeremiah and said, okay, I'll take it. But the problem is I can't let you quit because you don't control your calling. I do. You didn't call yourself. I called you. And when I decide to shut you up, I'll shut you up. I'll remind you that you are not in control. I wish I had about 10 people, I'd make number 11, that'll thank God that when you wanted to give up, God didn't give up on you. You are still here, not because of yourself, but God didn't quit you when you wanted to quit God. Maybe we need to accept that quitting is only by God and not by you. And therefore you can't quit because quitting's not in God. Because he said that he that had begun. <laughs> I wish I had some help in this room. A good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If I let you quit, then you will forfeit a life that matters. If I let you quit, then you got power over my purposes than you. I can't let you quit even when you want to quit. So here's what God did. Y'all ready? Here's where the text turns. He says, uh, I made up in my mind, I'm not even going to mention his name. I made up in my mind I'm not going to speak for him or mention his name. Y'all got a Bible? You got a Bible? When Jeremiah said that, he wrote that in future tense. I thought y'all could read the Bible in this church. He says, I said to myself, I will not mention your name. I will not speak anymore for you those are jeremiah's future intentions that's in verse eight but in verse nine he says but his word was in my heart as fire 
set up in my bones. All right, y'all still ain't giving y'all boss ain't been to English class. He had designed his future, but God had already put in a provision before he decided to quit. The fire was there already in the past tense before Jeremiah had made a decision to quit because God had installed the fire knowing that Jeremiah was going to face some quitting days. You missed this show, I'll shout myself. God knows some stuff gonna happen to you that he didn't tell you. He know you gonna face some days that you want to give up, but he put the fire inside of you so that when a quitting day came, it would light up in your spirit. Okay, y'all must don't read the Bible. You do know that folk who've been called have considered quitting. Numbers chapter 11. Moses told God. It's better to be a dead person than a living pastor. This church too much. Hey God. Don't just go get another pastor. Kill me. I don't even want the members to come find me. <laughs> Moses wanted to quit. All right, y'all still ain't feeling me. Uh, uh, Elijah is threatened by, Je by Jezebel. He wants to quit and ask God to perform euthanasia. Oh. The disciples wanted to quit when they saw how Jesus got arrested and was given over to Roman capital punishment for the charges of treason. People who have been called have had a season where they wanted to quit. But thanks be to God, the time you wanted to quit the fire started burning. I'm about done. I'm about done. Y'all kept me out late, so don't rush me this morning. <laughs> I, 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 I'm about done. The Hebrew etymology of this fire shut up in my bones comes from a Hebrew word, ba'ar. And it, it transliterates inspiration. He says the inflammation was inspiration. What it really means is the time I wanted to quit, God spoke again. Y'all missed it. I said the time I wanted to quit, God spoke again. Has that ever been anybody's testimony in this room? That the very time you went cold on God was the time God spoke again and gave you inspiration that was going to outlast your desire of resignation. Look what he says here. Look what he says here, Daniel Foster. In one verse, he was uh, a, a reproach to me. In the very next verse, he says it was fire shut up in my bones. Maybe the real preacher has to accept that the word of God is both frustration and fire. <laughs> Maybe the real preacher has to accept it's not either or. It's both and. Y'all ain't feeling me, so let me help you. Monday through Friday, you in frustration with the word. But by the time Sunday morning gets here, you on fire about the word. Is it anybody in here thankful that when you walk with the true of, word, of God's word, you've got to live between frustration and fire? One day you feel like resigning, but then inspiration comes. Lord, I can't get no help here. You, as a matter of fact, you're here this week because you need some more inspiration you need God to speak again I'm done here it is he said now now that I don't resolve my issues with God hey God what are you going to do about these people who are deriding me laughing at me every day he says my familiars are sitting back watching waiting on me to fall 
so they can get revenge. Why, am I, why do my friends want revenge? That's a whole nother question all by itself. What are you going to do about that? And by the time we get to verse 11, I'm done. Here's what he says. He said, don't worry about that. The Lord is with you. <laughs> he said, the Lord is with you. And if you read after verse 11, you will notice something beautiful. He says, after the Lord being with you, he said, your persecutors shall stumble. Wait a minute. Isn't that what they were waiting on me to do? The text says they were waiting on me to halter and limp and fall, but they're going to be the ones to stumble. He says, I will take my revenge on your persecutors. Wait a minute. Isn't that what they wanted to do to me? They wanted revenge on me. Y'all missed it. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the point in the text. If you can hang in there, God's presence will handle what he didn't tell you about. Because you thought his presence was just for your assignment, but really his presence was for the attacks that he didn't tell you about on the front end. But when his presence showed up, it flips the script and handles the stuff he didn't tell you about at the beginning. That's my word to you, ladies and gentlemen. But the Lord is with you. I need you to encourage your neighbor and tell him, but the Lord is with you and when the lord is with you he will handle the attacks he didn't announce to you you know about the assignment but his presence is there for the attacks that's why we gotta thank god for the fire i noticed y'all that when i read the bible whenever the lord's fire showed up something new happened exodus chapter three that theophany of that burning bush was to call a new pastor. <laughs> when that fire showed up, there was a sign of God was going to do something new. Exodus chapter 40, when the tabernacle had been settled, the Bible says the fire of God settled on the tabernacle by night to demonstrate a new holiness. First Kings chapter 18, when, when Elijah was up on Mount Carmel and they had the battle of the gods, the Bible says, and God answered by fire and caused a new revival. But in the New Testament, the saints were assembled after Jesus had gone to heaven. And the Bible says that they were assembled in one place on one accord. And there fell tongues of, of as like a fire on the end of on the end them. And they spoke as the spirit gave them utterance. That was fire for a new dispensation. I need somebody in here to thank God that God is going to light a new fire in you. So you can go on. Would you just encourage somebody and tell them it's about to start now. Ooh, it's about to start now. Have I got myself a witness in this place? All I need, Lord, have mercy. It's for God to speak again. I said, All I need is for God. Lord to speak again have I got a witness here God let you come from all over America just so you could hear him speak again God let you get up this morning just so you could hear him speak again and when the fire is on the inside God will I said God will give you a new determination just when you was getting ready to give up he won't let you quit and I got a witness here I said just when you were getting ready to give up God lit a fire under you is it anybody glad 
that the fire is still burning. You said you wasn't going to go back to that church, but it was like fire. Ooh, shut up in your bones. You said you were going to quit the ministry, but it was like fire. Shut up in your bones. You said you were going to fight another preacher, but it was like fire. Yeah, shut up in your bones and thank God that when you wanted to quit, he wouldn't let you quit. And now you got a new determination. Now you got new vision. Is it anybody glad that the God we serve won't let you quit? Have I got a witness here? I'm reminded of one other individual who was a victim of his own obedience y'all slept on that I said I'm reminded of another individual who was a victim of his own obedience I'm reminded of another individual whose friends turned their back on him his own company walked down on him and his biggest problem was that God had forsaken him I heard him say God why have you forsaken me but that was on Friday Lord have mercy. Sunday morning, that same God that forsook him on Friday got him up on Sunday morning. Because you think it's over, but I got new fire. Is it anybody glad that the God you serve will get you up when you thought it was over? Anybody glad that your church is a better place because God put a new fire in your belly. Now I know it ain't Sunday morning, but I need you to look at your neighbor. I said look at your neighbor and tell them neighbor I speak fire in your spirit in the name of Jesus and every weapon that is formed against you is not going to prosper you going to go back with a new fire you going to serve with a new fire and the anointing of the Holy Ghost rest on you now in the body here glad that God will give you another chance if you're ready for a new assignment if you're ready for new joy then just lift your hands and say spirit of the living God yeah, yeah, we should be doing this at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yes, sir. Ain't he all right? I said, Ain't he all right? Won't he give you a new fire? Yeah.